George Aquamenta. I'm a professor of um, pharmaceutical sciences at the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. Um, I'm also the president of the um, Convention of Biomedical um, Research Ghana. Um, today, we are going to begin our series, our webinar series on the SARS, um, um, SARS um, virus, um, COVID-2, um, COVID-19 um, series. And we have two speakers lined up today, two very exciting speakers lined up today. Um, Without any ado, I will begin the introductions. Usu is a lecturer at the Department of Medical Diagnosis um, at the Faculty of Allied Health Sciences at Kwame Krumah University of Science and Technology. Um, he's also affiliated with the Kumasi Center for Collaborative Research in Tropical Medicine. Um, Dr. Owusu got his PhD um, through a collaboration between um, UST and the University of Bonn Medical Center in Germany. Um, his specialization um, is in the area of viral zoonosis, um, which essentially has to do with the transmission of viruses um, from other species to humans. Um, his, his research uh, looks at the role of human viruses in causing acute respiratory illnesses in um, children as well as in adults. Um, he, his research also includes such things as screening Hajj pilgrims uh, for the Mid Middle East in, um, respiratory syndrome. Um, coronaviruses are involved in that as well. He has been studying bat interactions um, as a proxy for viral um, zoonosis. Um, Dr. Owusu um, does research uh, through the African Program for Advanced Epi Epidemiology Training uh, and the Africa Research Excellence Fund. That, those are the agencies that fund this current research. Uh, so without um, further ado, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, we have here Dr. Michael Owusu. Um, following him, we'll have um, Dr. Bafu Boni, um, uh, um, who will be speaking to us from Saudi Arabia. I'll introduce him after Dr. Michael Owusu has uh, finished his talk. So here's how we'll do it. Dr. Owusu will talk uh, for the next 40 to 45 minutes, and then Dr. Bafu Boni uh, will talk for the same amount of time, and then we'll have uh, the rest of the time um, reserved for questions and answers. Dr. Wusu, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Rightly. Uh, my topic will cover structure, replication, and epidemiology. And I'm delivering this within 40 minutes. So some of the things I may not be able to uh, talk much detail. So, but maybe when the questions come, uh, they will be able to um, address this. So I work at KCCR as well as a virologist, one of the centers that is uh, actively involved in testing for uh, coronaviruses in Ghana. The second, the, the largest one is in Accra, which is uh, Noguchi. So uh, next slide, please. So I'll take this from the basics uh, to help those who are not in the field of viruses to understand. So gradually we can build into getting to know um, all that we have to know about coronaviruses. So viruses are regarded as entities or molecules that uh, have been in existence for years. Apart from infecting animals, they can also infect bacteria, they can infect fungi, they can infect a protozoa. Uh, most viruses are regarded as obligate intracellular parasites of, of animals and other organisms, mostly they enter into cells and then they undergo their reproductive activities. So viruses can either have an RNA or a DNA, but not the two. But then there are viruses that could have RNA strand as one segment and has a DNA as an overlapping strand. But in most cases, they don't have these two. And they are classified based on the nature of the strand. So you could have an RNA virus, you could have a DNA viruses. And whether they are RNA or DNA, they can further be classified into levels of polarity. You could have an RNA which is a positive sense RNA virus, or that one that is a negative sense RNA virus. And 
these properties to classify viruses into different groupings based on uh, their molecular properties, based on their growth properties in mediums, and based on how they behave uh, in cell lines as well. Next slide. So uh, there are different structures of viruses, but then the basic structure is what is shown on the left. Every virus has a nucleic acid, which is covered with a capsid. The capsid can vary in several uh, structures depending on the nature of the viruses. So this capsid is, uh, has um, an icosahedral shape. It has about 20 surfaces with this virus in it. Some other viruses don't have this icosahedral shape. Some of them have a helical structure. So the, the, the capsid, the, the molecules are wounded in a helical form. If you take viruses like Ebola viruses, for instance, they are helical structure, but then other viruses like uh, rhino viruses and many others are, have this kind of uh, nucleocapsid structure. Some of the viruses are enveloped. So we call them enveloped viruses. Others don't have envelopes. We call them non-enveloped viruses. So each of these confers some form of properties to them. And once you mention a virus, it has to fit within one of these. Either is enveloped or maybe it's not enveloped. And what is enveloped, it could either have an icosahedral capsid or perhaps maybe a helical uh, capsid. Next slide, please. So when it comes to coronaviruses, coronavirus is one of the family of viruses. Uh, to date, the last time I checked, there are over, 100 and, over 136 families, if I remember well, but every now and then, new families keep building up. So one of the family is the coronavirus family. There are about seven viruses which are within this family structure, which cause human infections. But there are many, many other ones that can cause animal uh, infections that I'll mention a few of them for you to see. So almost all coronaviruses have this structure. They are enveloped and then they have uh, a nucleocapsid made up of the nucleic acid, which is encased within, as you see from the structure. They have a spike region, they have a membrane protein, they have small membrane protein as well. And then they are single-stranded, non-segmented, and then they are positive sense RNA virus, which means that uh, they undergo direct, uh, they can produce proteins directly, or they act as messenger RNA when they enter into the cell. What is important is that the nucleo, the, the, cap, the spike of this virus is responsible for virus entry or binding to cells. And it's also the one responsible for eliciting B and T cell responses, and also has something to do with the virulence of the virus. So if you want to determine the immune response of the virus, you mostly want to study the spike gene. Um, mutations in the spike gene has some role in what, what vaccines you have to produce. If the spike gene mutates very, very sharply, then you will expect that the vaccines will also have to follow the same pace. But if you hope that the the, the, if, the, if the spike gene remains conserved for a long time, then you are lucky that your vaccines that are targeting the spike gene will be able to at least uh, succeed for some time. So most of the time, the spike gene is one of the things that many researchers want to observe how well this changes and whether uh, this is able to uh, cause some sort of immune responses and, and how best you can deal with it. Next slide, please. So um, as I mentioned um, earlier, if you want to understand more about the classification of viruses, the ICTV, what is the International uh, Committee for Taxonomy of Viruses, have classified uh, these viruses and they published this in the consensus statement in Nature Microbiology. So they have realms, they have kingdom, they have phyla, they have about classes, and then they have families. So we have about 168 families as we speak now with 103 subfamilies, and there are 1,421 1, genera of which coronaviruses form into it. So if you are interested in knowing more, you can zoom through their website and then understand how these classifications are done and how come new viruses are discovered and how they are named. Next slide, please. So as a, with coronaviruses, uh, as I mentioned, they are in the family we call the Nidoviralis family. There are about two or three other organisms or families which are there. Their family name is called Coronaviridae. The subfamily 
school hierarchy. There are four diff, uh, um, sub genuses which are within this cloud. We have the alpha coronaviruses, we have the beta, we have the gamma, and we have the, the delta. Uh, next slide. So the alpha coronaviruses, uh, in fact, the human causing coronaviruses are in two groups, the alpha and the beta. So if you take the alpha, the two main viruses which infect human beings, we call them human coronavirus 229E and then NL63, which are in red. These ones have been causing infections in the human populations since the 1960s. So many people who have common cold can have um, um, one of these viruses. They are very mild. They don't cause severe disease. But aside this, you have other viruses which have the, which have the same uh, um, makeup, similar um, to this. Some of them could be found in bats, the Minopterus bats. Others could be found in, um, in swine. Others could be found in other species of bats. But all these are classified into one genus we call the alpha coronaviruses. Next. The next important group is the beta coronavirus family. So what we worry most uh, in the world is the family in the beta coronaviruses. So this one includes uh, human coronavirus HKU1, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronaviruses, severe acute respiratory syndrome coronaviruses, and then the new one, which is the SARS-CoV-2, the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. So all these are classified in the beta. And you can see that within the same beta family, you have also beta coronavirus 1, which is in bats. The other bats could be the Pipetrellus bat, which also has another strain of viruses. Roseltus also have similar. So if you look at the cluster of virus, it tells you that this is why it is possible for recombinations to occur between bats and then they can re-emerge into other forms. So the beta coronavirus is a family which is of, of most interest when it comes to studying the outbreak of coronaviruses. And it's possible that next virus that could emerge could also form within this cluster. And this is where we have to be very much uh, observing as we go, we go through the years. Uh, next. So the delta ones could be found in some animals and fishes. And the next one, the last one, well, next slide please, which is in the, uh, the, the, the other ones like uh, quails and other ones could also have their own viruses. Next slide please. And then we have the avian ones, which could be in the gamma coronavirus family. So those ones mostly don't seem to cause problems because uh, the fish ones, I'm, I'm not sure why, but we don't seem to have problems with they combining with the human strains to form emerging strains. So the gamma and the delta looks much safer as we, as we haven't seen any thema. But the beta is where the hot groups occur. And most of the bats seem to cluster in the beta and the alpha family. So they are the ones that we mostly focus on when we come to outbreaks of coronaviruses. Next slide, please. So uh, if you look at the, the alpha and the beta, uh, this is similar to the classification. Uh, if you look at the first one, which is within the B group, you could see that uh, with this phylogenic tree presented by Coutard et al in 2000, the date is wrong, but this is somewhere around 2020. The new cov 2 which is, which is uh, with the asterisk clusters with some few bad strain, which is called ZXC21, and then SARS coronavirus 1, which seem to be in the same uh, um, um, similarities. I'll later tell you the details about them. But the HKU1, OC43 also have their own group, and then the 229 LH3 form within the alpha group. And then, I mean, uh, we'll talk more about this group as we move on. Next slide, please. So what is, what, is, what is the nature of these viruses? One is that they are difficult to propagate in cell cultures, uh, very difficult to grow, especially the 229E that we know earlier. It has been very difficult to grow. But then other ones like the SARS and what we have as the current COV-2 are viruses that can, can, can be able to grow in cell lines. What has been done and what we did in our group some years back is that we mostly we use cell lines from bats, especially uh, new, uh, newborn bats, or even the old ones, it's possible to harvest their cells, grow them in the lab, and it's possible to grow those viruses in them. Because the bats are the major reservoirs, a lot of those viruses
virus can comfortably be removed. But they also have high frequency for recombination. This is why they can most of the time cause uh, problems. And they bad in the endoplasmic reticulum and also in the Golgi uh, apparatus. Next slide, please. So when it comes to the new uh, coronaviruses, which is the SARS coronavirus 2. So as of now, uh, we understand that these viruses can replicate in some human cell lines, as well as bat cell lines, rabbit cell lines, and cat cell lines. So viral A6, which is one of the common cell lines, is possible to grow this one in them. But uh, you should note that you cannot grow this under the normal bi-safety level two and three. Once you want to venture into growth, you have to use the bi-safety level four, which in the whole of Africa, I think that is, uh, is it, uh, I'm sure it's about the Gambia and South Africa, which have the BSL-4. We in Ghana, we don't have what it takes to grow uh, the, the SARS coronavirus too. So what we do mostly is to process them under uh, BSL-3, where we can extract the nucleic acid and make them safer for working in other levels uh, of the lab. Next slide, please. So what do we know more about the genomic structure? So what I've shown here are the four coronaviruses which we are familiar with. So if you look at the strand, you could see that they all have the replicates protein. This, the first one we call opioidin frame 1A and opioidin frame 1B, followed by the spike, the protein that, uh, uh, the gene that encodes for the spike protein and then we have the accessory proteins, and then we have the envelope, the membrane, and mucocapsid. So all the coronavirus are supposed to be uh, um, undergo transcription through these genes to form various structures that have to um, form their, their nature. So if you look at the alpha, the beta, and they have this. The mess, which is very recent, has similar structure, but then if you look closely, they differ in the number of in the different accessory proteins. So, for instance, 229 NLC3 have 4A, 4B, but if you go to OC43 and HKU1, they have 4 and 5A. SARS have 5, 6, 7A, 7B, 8A, 8B, and MERS has 4A, 4B. So, the new ones that come seem to always have a difference in their accessory proteins, but mostly. The open reading frames seem to be similar, but some of them also differ in the spike as well. Next slide. So what we also understand uh, about these uh, new ones is that the, the new SARS-2 coronavirus seem to differ from the earlier SARS, uh, especially in the spike gene. So this is a diagram which is from one uh, published paper uh, that is from Zoo et al. in Nature 2020, which try to look at the difference between the new SARS-2 virus and then the bat virus. So they look at bat BATG13 and then other forms of bat and to determine which one could be the parent, uh, parental reservoir for this new strain. So the graph which is down there shows the differences in terms of the open reading frame 1A, 1B, the spike and the accessory protein. If you look at the graph, you can see that the blue one, which is the BAT RATG13, seem to have a similar similarity in terms of their nu the, the, the nucleotide similarity with the SARS-2. Whereas the other strains like the BAT W1, uh, HKU3 seem to differ. So, the spike gene uh, seemed to have, you could see it's falling down a bit. It seemed to be the main area that uh, differentiates this virus from the other ones. As a matter of fact, the spike gene has about 75% similarity with the new SARS. And this is what differentiates that one from the old one, which is what people think that makes this one quite new. Perhaps why they named it as SARS-2. On my right, I show some differences that are in, in this new uh, virus compared to the old ones. And when you study the genome, you can better see some few similarities that could, could uh, let us know what is happening with this new strain. Next slide. So the next slide uh, further shows, uh, which also was taken from a presentation that was given by uh, one uh, Suzanne uh, on 
from their university, who tried to show also the clusters for the spikes in terms of the bat BATG13 clustering with other strains. And you can see that within the cluster, the new coronavirus seemed to cluster more closely with the bat BATG13. So as we speak now, it looks like the bat BATG13 is the parent strain or the parent um, uh, virus, which have about 96.3% sequence similarity with the new SARS coronavirus 2. So it seems that this one could be the mother strain, but, but it's early day, yes, because many tests have been done in different bus strains to determine exactly which ones are, are the parent strain and, and whether any, any ones could come as new. But as, as we speak now, this one seems to be the parent one, and we believe that this SARS-2 might have emerged from bat CAGT13, and then there could be an intermediate host, which we don't know yet, but then could have played a role in further introducing the differences in the spike which has, which has entered into the human population. Next, next slide. So one other thing that is of interest in this virus, so one of the things is that if you compare this new virus to the earlier SARS coronavirus 2, every coronavirus have their own receptor. And so, this, the MERS one has the dipeptidyl peptidase receptor, which is used to um, attach to the host cells. So it needs this particular thing on the host cell to be able to enter into the cell. Um, other ones like the earlier SARS virus, SARS virus 1, and then human coronavirus NLC3 will use the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 as the receptor for the virus. So, uh, this virus is virulent, not based on the receptor, because human coronavirus NL63 also has the same H2 receptor. Uh, the study we did earlier in Ghana is we reported about 30% of people as having the human coronavirus NL63 in them, especially in children. Most people have it, but what they have is very mild. It doesn't cause them to have severe respiratory problems like we see with this new one. So having the H2 may not be uh, uh, an indicator for pathogenicity of this virus. But what is believed is that this particular one in the H2 seem to have stronger affinity uh, for binding SARS-2 compared to SARS-1 and the NLC3. So people think, some researchers think that the affinity or the strength of the binding could play a role. And you can read more in the one et al. paper who tried to show that the SARS-2 can bind more strongly to the H2 compared to other forms of SARS. So perhaps the, the strength of the affinity may, be, may, may tell more why this one may have more problems or may cause more problems than the other one. And this, these receptors, you can find them in the pneumocytes of the lungs. You can find them in the heart muscles. You can find them in the enterocytes of the intestines. And of late, uh, other people are trying to look at other cells. We don't know, but these three are the major areas that people can find. This is why they, are, they can cause diarrhea because you can find them in the intestine, in the seasonal cells. They can cause pneumonia because they could be in the lungs. They could cause cardiovascular problems because they could be in the endothelial cells of the myocardium of, of the heart. So wherever they are receptors, they are able to attach and they can cause uh, problems. Next slide. So how do they replicate? They replicate like, like uh, many other coronaviruses. And this is also a slide borrowed from uh, one other presentation, the one, uh, one uh, presenter, uh, which paper was uh, in Fung and Liu uh, in uh, Frontiers of Microbiology as of 2014. So every coronavirus will bind to its own receptor. If it's the SARS-2, it has to bind to the H2. If it's MERS, it binds to the dipeptidyl peptidase. Once it enters into the cell, it is able to bind to the ribosome. So this is two ribosomes which are combined, as you can see. And then once it binds to the ribosome, it is able to undergo some form of processing to form uh, the, the, the open reading frame protein. This is the polyprotein 1A, 1B, which is encoded by the open reading frame 1A, 1B. And this one can further undergo, undergo proteolytic lysis to form accessory proteins, which is what we'll talk about later. And then through other pathways is able to produce uh, uh, the negative strand RNA, which can then enter into, into its own envelopes through the endoplasmic reticulum. And this 
can bad off through the cell. So this process is what the, the, the virus go through every time. You could see that other path can form the membrane, the, the envelope, and then the spike, which can further join the whole process before they can bud off in the cell. So, but then there are two days. So we have the genomic, the genomic RNA, which is, which, which is what I've shown on the left. And then we have the subgenomic messenger RNA, which is what you see uh, on the right. So the subgenomic messenger RNA is what forms the membrane, the envelope, and the spike. And the genomic is what forms most of the other accessory uh, proteins. Next slide. So this is also uh, once one pre uh, slide presented by Lee et al. in Medical Virology, where she tried to show um, why, why, or what makes this spike protein of the SARS very new from the others. So if you can see, these are uh, the genomic structure for SARS coronavirus 2, for pangolin, and then for RATG13. So, as I said, RATG13 looks like the, the parental strain with about 96% sequence um, similarity with the, with, the, with the SARS coronavirus 2. We are not too sure whether pangolin is the intermediate host because it has about 90% similarity. But what is strange about this new SARS-2 virus is that it has a cleavage site, we call the furin cleavage site. So the furin site is not present in pangolin and it's not present in the TATG13. Ideally, if you want to classify, I mean, an organism as a reservoir, you will expect to share most of the sequences and then most of the proteins with the, with the parent or with the intermediate host. But as I said, the viruses isolated from the pangolin lacks the furin site, and the ones isolated from TATG13 also lacks the furin site. So it looks like possession of furin sites seem to give these new ones some extra ability in terms of attaching and then firmly gripping onto the host cell and causing infection. So they have the furin cleavage site is an important site that many scientists are trying to study to understand what makes this one new from the others. Next slide. Next slide, please. OK. So uh, once again, trying to study the, 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 the importance of the furin site, Kutag, uh, in his recent paper in antiviral research, did some further sequencing to know what makes this one different. On my left, uh, for those of you who are not conversant with the amino acid technologies, you can see that the, the letters which are displayed have their meanings on the left side. So uh, if you see an, an A is an alanine amino acid encoded by some uh, nucleotides. So what they found out in their paper is that the furin site, which is located on the side two of the spike, seem to be different. If you look at the asterisk on the 2019 NCOV2, you could see that it has some furin site sequences like uh, A, Y, T, and I, which is what makes this one quite unique. If you, if you group this together with all the other strains, those strains seem to lack those uh, sequences that enable them to form the furin site, but this one seems to have the furin site. So, the furin side is a major area that many people are interested in. And if you want to study this, then you can, you can better uh, know how well this can play in terms of giving the virus an extra ability to cause some more pathogenic infections compared to the old uh, SARS strain viruses. Next slide, please. So more about the replication. So this one is on the, on the, on the visual picture. Uh, you could see that the receptor, which is the spike, can attach to H2, but it does also this in combination with uh, the sharing protease. It's also very important. So the, the host needs together a, a transmembrane sharing protease to combine before the, the spike can attach. And once it attaches, it's able to enter. So you, it's, if without this sharing protease, it also makes it difficult for other virus to enter. So one of the targets for study perhaps for those in pharmacology or other vaccines, is also to look at the role of the other protein. 
or is two to enable entry to occur. Next slide. So what does the virus do when it enters into the cell? Uh, I may not be able to go into the details of the pathogenesis, but then SARS-CoV-2 has an ability to cause some regulatory problems. And uh, for instance, we know that it can cause apoptosis to cell, and then it can cause regulation of H2. And those of you who study medicines will know that the H2 also plays an important role in uh, causing uh, some regulation in hypertensive patients. So some of the hypertensive drugs seem to have some targets with H2. So a virus that has an ability to regulate H2 has some extra strength and capacity in terms of uh, causing some more severe disease. So it's not surprising that if you're hypertensive and diabetic, you could have problems whenever you get this because of the way it can play about with H2. So because of these regulatory abilities, it can cause lymphopenia, vascular permeability, and can cause upset in cytokines, which we call the cytokine storm whenever this uh, also turns the infection. The antibody antigen complex can also cause cellular damages, lung injury, and can cause many other uh, uh, diseases that you may not want to uh, also see. It also has a way of regulating the cytotoxic CD8 cells. So if you want to look at in detail about the T helper cells one and two, they have a way of trying to cause either an increase or a decrease in this. And this is what cumulatively can make this virus quite lethal when it comes to causing the infection and disease. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a bit of a slide uh, in uh, nature that try to review some proteins which may be of interest to those, once again, in who study drugs. Uh, pharmacology and vaccines. So coronaviruses are able to produce about 16 accessory proteins. We know the function of some of them. Others is not too clear. So some, some functions like NSP14 and the NDOU, the exon 325, the primates, each of these have a role they play. So ideally, many scientists are trying to understand each of these accessory proteins and see what role they play either in pathogenesis or whether they can be targeted in trying to uh, either uh, reduce infections or drugs which could bind to them and which could be stopped. So the functionality of this in SARS-2 is also of interest. So as you study this, you can understand what role they play and how they do. So the open reading frame one and two what is what encodes for all these ones. And the more you know about them, the better we can deal with this new strain of, of the virus. Next slide. Okay, so when it comes to the new SARS-2, uh, the earlier slide is, shows the 16 proteins which are produced to, by the open reading frame one and two. But then this new, new uh, SARS-2 has an extra or some new other accessory proteins. We have the open reading frame six, which interferes with the nuclear trans translocation. And then open reading frame eight, which also has some role to play uh, as far as deletion of certain nucleotides are concerned. Open reading frame 10, which is, what is within the nucleocapsid region, we, we don't still know what it does. And more of this has been explained in the paper by Chan et al. in Emerging Microbes and Infections, where many others are trying to look. So it's also believed that the additional presence of open reading frame three, open reading frame six, and open reading frame eight accessory proteins is what perhaps may give this virus some extra strength. So some strains from Singapore, for instance, seem to show a deletion of the open reading frame eight, what is in the SARS-2, whereas others don't seem to show this. So as you study this, it's good to understand the differences between this and the new strains which are being gathered to know whether it's still mutating or it's still the same. Next slide. So now that we at least, uh, this is the basics about the structure. But as I said, information is emerging. And as we get new information, we can understand. So I mentioned earlier that in 1960s was when we began to see the OC43, which was in the earlier uh, stages. And now we have the, the HKU1, NLC3, SARS-2, which occurred in 2003, and the MERS, which occurred in somewhere to 
which so this is how what has been the transmission line of, of the coronaviruses. Next slide. So I mentioned this earlier. Uh, as I said, uh, coronaviruses, most of the reservoir is in bats. The intermediate host, which was in the SARS earlier one, was in palm civets and raccoon dogs, which is what I showed up there for the SARS coronavirus. And then the mess was through um, uh, the camels uh, in Saudi Arabia. And then the SARS-CoV-2 is believed is pangolin, but then the evidence is not strong enough. So we can't tell it's pangolin. We still have to search for more because of the difference in the, the, the lack of few, the, the fewing cleavage sites and also the big difference in the spike region, which is much different from uh, this one, although they are quite similar. We don't know for LSC3, we don't know the host. OC43 who have come from cattle. HKU1, we are not too sure. So we don't know the next strain. It is possible the next strain could emerge in any of this, which could cause problems for the entire globe. Next, next uh, slide, please. Well, so I've talked about this already, uh, which we don't know about the pangolin, but we still have to look for more as to what the pangolin does. Uh, next slide. Okay, so what have we done in Ghana so far? Uh, in Ghana, uh, the study group uh, at KCCR has done a number of studies on coronaviruses. So one of the bats we have studied a lot is what we call the Hipposiderus kefa ruba bat. There are a number of caves in Ghana which have this bat. And each cave we have studied has close to over 20 to 30,000 of these bats. There are two of these bats in Ghana, two main types. We have the insectivorous bats which are the smaller type, they normally feed on insects. And then we have the fruit bat. They are the large one that you see on the trees. And all these two, two types are in Ghana. So in few studies we have done uh, over the years, somewhere in 2009, what we did was that we collected the feces or the, the feces from these bats from the caves. And we have done a number of uh, tests on these bats. So one of the papers which is shown, you could see that we have tested about 40 stool samples of these bats and we have seen about 10 of them be positive. And the strain of the bat, with, uh, the strain of the bat we found in this bat seemed to cluster with the earlier SARS-2, which was identified in 2003. But then when we did a further investigation to know whether it can cross through the cell lines, it particularly could not do that. But what it tells us is that it's possible that along the line, some of these strains which we have found, it's possible some of them uh, could cross and enter into the human strain. Uh, we did a lot of search to find them in the human population, but we couldn't find any of them. But it's possible as the years go by, uh, you could have some of them emerge, uh, which is what we have shown. We have done other studies in Eidolon bats and Rosetus bats, and I've seen antibodies to some of these coronaviruses in them. So even in Africa, it doesn't mean we are free. Uh, it's possible that any recombination could occur. And the next pandemic is possible could emerge from any part of Africa because these bats are with us and they can spill into the population at any time. Next slide, please. So one study we did uh, related to the bat is that when we saw that a lot of the bats, which are the Hipposiderus kefa ruba, some of them are the Nisteris bats and the Eidolon helvum bats and Rosetus bats, which have some of these uh, viruses. We screen a number of the populations, uh, over 300 to close to 1,000 people in the communities uh, which are in these places. We search for a number of these, whether we could find new uh, viruses either in those populations or not, but we couldn't find any of them. What we found was a normal coronavirus. So what we found was 229E, HKU1, NLC3, OC43, which we have published in PLOS1. So you could see that in Ghana, you could have, among people who have respiratory disease, is about 5.9% uh, in them, 0.5 for HKU1, 3.4 in NLC3, and then also OC43, about 29 also, normal people who don't have any infections also have some of these 229E in them, some of NLC3 in them. And then you could see on my 
uh, which we plotted. And these strains are similar. They don't cluster with any of the bad strains which we have in the world. Uh, what question we, we tell ourselves is that uh, I don't know uh, how many uh, 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 in Western world, how many people are exposed to the normal strains. But one question that people ask is why is it that the coronavirus in Africa is very mild? Although we haven't done much study to know why, what some of us feel is that it's possible that a number of people in Ghana already have almost all the four types of normal human coronavirus. So perhaps it's possible the antibodies from this could have some cross, uh, cross protective uh, ability or immunity. Uh, I mean, which is why maybe some of us may, may not have the severe type. I don't know yet, but then it's possible to do zero survey to understand how many people have antibodies to all this and whether this one could offer some cross protective immunity. If it's so, then it's possible that many people in Africa may already have the first four types and that could give us some extra abilities or some extra immunity to this and why this could be maybe mild or less severe compared to the Western world. More research is needed to understand what this is playing out to be. Next slide, please. So what does it do? Uh, uh, I know that coronavirus uh, for this new SARS-2 can cause problems uh, in terms of causing normal disease, a lot of asymptomatics. This is a cross section of uh, 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 pictures taken through using a scan. And, uh, severe disease can cause collapse of, of the lungs. So for those who have it, it means that it can be very severe in them. Next slide, please. So uh, one, 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 one issue to understand more about this is that uh, what, which, what the earlier coronavirus did not do. Uh, one question people may ask is that why is it that it can cause problems in the other parts of the body, although the receptors may not be there. So what we are learning about this new, apart from just causing lungs, because the receptors are the pneumocytes of the lung. So it makes reason that it's able to cause severe uh, pathology to the lungs or severe disease to the lungs. But then it's possible uh, from a paper published by uh, Yu Yinshun uh, is that this new SARS-2 can also move through the olfactory bulb into the brain. So once it's entered the brain, it's able to cause also some pathology in the brain. So it's not surprising that people who have this disease can also have problems with encephalitis, viral encephalitis, and could have some severe problem with the brain because of the potential for this to cross this and cause some problems with regards to that. And then also the, some of the cytokines which are released can make the blood-brain barrier very permeable and allow the viruses to move through the blood-brain barrier and also attack the brain cells. So for people who have it, it's not surprising to see that they also have some form of encephalitis. Others may have a, pro a manifest symptoms and disease which could, which could show that uh, the brain and the nerves are all involved and that could cause very severe problems in those who have, who have the, these infections. Next slide, please. So, um, okay, so um, next slide, we've talked about this already. We can go to the next slide, please. We just mentioned this already. Okay, so there are some questions that I will attempt to answer some of them. Uh, with few slides, then we can uh, bring this to a close. So has there been a mutation in the virus? Uh, and, then, and then somebody asks whether there are immunophenotypes and whether these differ from ethnicity. As we speak now, uh, we can't tell much whether these differ from ethnic group to ethnic group because uh, the various groups are still compiling the genomes. But as the genome become accumulated, we can understand how it differs from ethnicity to ethnicity. The strains we have, we have some knowledge about it, but then we can go ahead to explore more and whether mutations differ across continents. I will show you some few slides to let us know where, where we are now. Next slide, please. So in terms of the phylogenetics of this virus, one of the earlier papers that came as of March 17, published 
the offspring seem to show that the earliest genomes uh, from China, East Asia, USA, Canada, Europe, Australia seem to show about three strains. If you look at the graph very well, there are the strain B, which is from China and East Suburb, which clusters in one region. We have the strain A, which seem to cluster in places like in Canada and in the US. And then we have the strain C, which clusters in East Asia. So these are the three that seem to be circulating as at March 17, which we know. So it looks like everywhere, everybody and how, depending on who imported the virus, whatever, wherever you come from, the strain may mimic wherever you took it from and that can show the properties. Next slide, please. So as more genomes uh, became available, uh, we had a recent paper that was published to show that for those who were able to sequence the full genome of the virus, about eight complete genome of sars coronavirus 2 that there seemed to be deletion in the open reading frame 1AB at the early part of the gene. And then the latter part of the open reading frame 1AB, there is also another deletion, which you can see from the graph above. So this was from the Japan strain with a big deletion, which you can see from here. It's highlighted red, which is in the early part of the open reading frame 1AB. The blue one, which is from the USA, seem to have also a deletion in the latter part of the open reading frame 1AB. And then you have the Australian strain, which is in the in the conserved region in the trip prime end of the gene. So this is what uh, we seem to know uh, as of now. And there seem to be about 93 mutations which are occurring in the entire genome. It looks like the spike gene, which is the major focus for immunity or vaccines, there seem to be less conserved uh, activity going on, which is good for us, which shows that there could be some uh, advantage in terms of the new vaccines which are coming up. But then, as the genomes become more and more, we can better understand what is playing out with respect to this particular uh, uh, genome. Next slide, please. So another paper that also looked at uh, quite a number of genomes, uh, combining them around, also seemed to show that Apart from knowing that there are two earlier strains, uh, one, this paper from Mustak was trying to see whether the strain has a correlation with the pathogenicity of the virus. Why is it that in countries like Italy and Spain, there seem to be severe death compared to other countries which are like Africa and other places? Is there any reason? So he came out to find out that there seem to be deletion in some of the gene, the earlier strain, which is the wild type sars cov virus 2 has four uh, 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 genes, which is what we normally know, the, the guanine. And then there is a mutated strain, which doesn't have the guanine. That one is deleted. So if you look at the map of Italy, for instance, it's believed that those places with the mild conditions seem to have uh, the earlier strain, which is the wild type, which was from the Wuhan city. But those places which have the severe disease have, uh, which have the mild ones have the deletion. The earlier ones was more pathogenic. So the graph down there, if you look at it, the strain from Spain seem to have uh, the G gene, the, 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 the four, uh, the guanine in them, what is more richer in Spain, in France, and maybe in Germany. But places like Belgium, Netherlands, and Portugal seem to have few cases because they have the, the mutated one which have deletion in the gene replaced by the adenine and then the cytosine uh, group. This is not very convincing, but this could suggest that perhaps those who have strains with deletion in the gene could have a mild or a less severe form compared to those which have uh, uh, strain which have the wild type directly from the Wuhan city. But this is a function of your health, health sector, function of how many tests you can do, function of the capability of public health to respond. So all these have to be looked at in a bigger context. It's possible maybe in Germany, they may have more of the, 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 the wild type from 
but because of their extra capacity in testing and isolation, maybe this is why they seem to have less uh, issue, uh, cases compared to the others. So for those of us in Africa, we need more information to understand how this is playing out. Next slide, please. Um, yes, so, okay, go ahead. So in the next slide, uh, uh, okay, I've talked about this already. Uh, let's go to the next slide because of time, uh, not to stretch you much. Next slide. Yeah, so what we know in Africa, whether Africa has strains from the A or gene type is not too clear. But then the earlier sequence from Nigeria seemed to show that there are sequence clusters with sequences from Germany, from Finland, from Switzerland. So perhaps this may have the mild type, which, is, which could explain why there could be mild cases in us. But this is just one single genome. It may not be enough for us to know. There's a website from Nextera, which have more of the genes. We can't tell where this is coming from, but as we analyze this, we'll be able to know how this is occurring across, across the African region. Next slide, please. So why is Africa having a low cases? One could be because of uh, um, age. I mean, earlier predictions showed that Africa will have had a lot of significant deaths from uh, Imperial College, but this is not so because of what we are seeing now. These are the earlier predictions which were made somewhere in the early part of the year, looking at the bed capacity, but we don't have these beds. Yeah, the cases are low because of reasons that are quite unexplained. Next slide, please. One of the reasons could be because of age. Uh, you could see that our pyramid for ages seem to narrow down as you go up. 80 years and above are few. And if you look at the, the, the graph on the left, what is from the cases from the US, which is occurring more after the age of 70 years, we don't seem to have that. So, it's possible we are having, we are safe because of that. People also believe that the vaccines that we have taken, BCG and many things will have some protection, but we still don't know. It's, it's better to explain this more as we move on. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, so uh, host, do I have some time or we can end here for now? Yes, um, we have gone over time, but if you, if you can just um, do the wind down and then we'll have time at the end for questions and then you can use some of the time. Okay, so my last three, three presentation is on the epidemiology of the virus. Epidemiology of the virus, you have to understand this based on what we call the reproductive number. This is what makes us of two very different from the others. So if you look at measles, measles has a reproductive number of about 16. What it means is that if one person is infected with measles, he can generate secondary infections of up to 16 of them. This can occur within a small unit of time. So if you look at the new SARS-2, what is about two to three? What it means that if you have one infection, you can infect two people, two can infect four, and this can move on. So this is what determines the epidemic curve of the virus, which is what we talk about, which is why it can explode into exponential order and can decline through the phase. Next slide, please. So in terms of understanding the epidemic curve, what is the epidemiology of the virus? Because of the reproductive number, you can model the virus through an exponential curve. What this means is that if you do nothing, we say that the virus can grow and can peak and can decline through the peak. If you employ all your measures, social distancing, the virus can fall. And this is how, we, this is how you can understand how the virus flows. I wouldn't spend much time because I'm, I'm limited. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, next slide, next slide, let me move through this. So in KNUST, uh, we are trying to, we have a group that is modeling the epidemiology of the virus to try to know, uh, please, a previous slide, please, the previous one. To try um, and then uh, underst understand the virus uh, very well. 
brief as we model this through the, using what we call the CES model, we can better understand what this means. What we are trying to do currently is that we have data on susceptible population exposed, those who are infected, those who are asymptomatic, those who are recovered, and those who are the disease in the different compartmental model. And we are trying to determine at what time point Ghana will peak and Ghana will decline. And whether our reproductive number is below one, and whether it is safer for us to open. So I think uh, we are almost done. And then once this is done, we'll send to the appropriate policymakers for them to be informed as to what will happen. Please go to my last slide, the host. Last, very last slide. Last slide, please. Last one. Yes. Is it this one? Okay, so, yes, I should think so. This is, I, uh, yes. So, this is just a, a strategy for us in Ghana, which I can't go much into detail. Maybe as questions come, we can understand our strategy and what we are doing as a country to be able to bring the epidemic cap down and then see how best we can do. So, thank you very much, host. And apologies for stretching you and your time beyond the limit. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm sure the audience is um, very much appreciative of these insights. Um, this is very, very, very insightful, and we, we appreciate um, your sharing them. Um, we will ask you to still hang on as a panelist because we'll have questions at the end. Um, we will now turn to Dr. Um, Henry Bafu Boni. Dr. Henry Bafu Boni. Um, he was my senior at Infant Film School. Um, he's a, an infectious disease specialist. He um, studied infectious disease at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. He practiced extensively and, and seen many, many, many patients here in the United States. Um, currently, he, he applies his trade in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. He works for the Saudi uh, government. He has very intimate knowledge of um, the Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome, the MERS. Um, his hospital saw the most patients, particularly in the 2015 outbreak. Um, so Dr. Bafuboni will share insights with us. Um, he will be addressing the topic when and how will the COVID-19 pandemic end? Lessons from the history of pandemics. So Dr. Ignatius Henry Bafuboni, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, um, George. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, first of all, um, I would like to um, congratulate Dr. Usu for a very excellent lecture which, um, in fact, I don't think I've heard anything as clear and erudite as such a delivery. And I really, really would like a transcript of that. Now, my topic is basically on when and how this pandemic, which has involved the whole world, will end. Now, I have a disclaimer. I cannot tell you the exact date this pandemic will end. I mean, for that, you might have to go to the you know, fortune tellers and pastors in Ghana for that. But what I can do is to give you an idea of what to expect based on past pandemics. Because if you study history of pandemics, we have some similarities and some lessons that we can take along. Now, before I start, let me tell you how I'm going to deliver this lecture. I'm going to go through very quickly the epidemiology of COVID-19 and uh, make a case for the uniqueness of COVID-19. Um, we've had an excellent, um, very excellent summary of how this coronavirus has evolved from previous coronaviruses. Um, and indeed, we are dealing with a new vir a novel virus. And I want to make a case for the um, exceptional nature of this virus and how it impacts on how we deal with this pandemic. Okay? 
So to start with, next slide. We all know that this virus has infected over 5 million people worldwide, and we have deaths in excess of 300,000. And the most recent data points to the fact that the hotspots are shifting to the Americas, mainly Brazil and the USA, and also, very interestingly, Russia, which started off claiming that they don't have a corona problem. So Russia, Brazil, and the USA seem to be the current hotspots. Now, as Dr. Usu very eloquently detailed, it seems that sub-Saharan Africa has been relatively spared. And I was very interested in learning about some of the data he presented concerning the um, gene deletions and all that stuff and the possibility of a less lethal virus circulating in that area. I think that was very interesting information. Um, I will add to that by detailing some of the postulates which have been um, put forward as to why there may be a difference in how the virus is expressed worldwide. Now, the next slide. Very quickly, when you compare um, the current virus, SARS-CoV-2, to other viruses, this is a graph which on the x-axis, we have the reproductive number, which is the R0, and on the y-axis, we have the mortality rate. Probably the most lethal virus in the world we all know is rabies. If you get rabies, you will die. There's no, nobody has ever survived rabies in the world, okay? And also the most infectious virus in the world we know is measles. As Dr. Usu mentioned, it has a reproductive factor upwards of 15 to 16. That one person with measles can give it to 16 people in an unmitigated environment. This new virus basically is at par with patients who treated HIV. Now, the thing to get from this graph is um, the COVID-19 virus is less lethal than its predecessors, meaning SARS and MERS, but it seems to be transmitted very efficiently. Next, um, next slide. Okay, now this slide compares um, the current coronavirus to other major viruses which have plagued us. Now, everybody knows about Ebola and Marburg virus, which are filoviruses with a very high mortality rate, okay? Now, when you compare this virus to the lethal viruses, obviously the mortality rate doesn't even reach 10%, okay? And the number of countries involved with these viruses, none of them exceeded 18, as you can tell. Now we have over 200 countries and territories involved with a mortality rate, which is going to be probably between two and 5%. Next slide. Now, the uniqueness of COVID-19, as I told you, um, I want to make a case for the uniqueness of COVID-19 and then proceed with my um, topic, which is giving historical anecdotes and which might guide us into what to expect for this virus. Now, one thing unique about COVID-19 is the asymptomatic carriage state. Very unlike many viruses which are respiratory. Usually when you have a respiratory virus, you get sick but it seems like between 30 to 40% of people who carry this virus do not get sick. And yet they can pass it on to people who get sick and who die. That in itself is something very significant and is of concern. And there seems to be some capriciousness about this COVID-19 virus in the sense that it has affected certain countries very badly and some countries have gone almost unscathed. Okay, now um, let's go to the previous slide. Um, okay, oh, I'm sorry. So um, I guess we can, okay, uh, other countries have gone unscathed. Now I want to introduce to you the concept of what we call the cycling time. And for um, Dr. Usu, I'm sure you're very familiar with this, but I want to correlate it 
to the infectiousness of this virus and how you know it impacts you know how we can expect this virus to be extinguished next slide very very briefly during the PCR technique, which is polymerase chain reaction, a sample is obtained from the nasopharynx of the patient. You see that to the right side of the screen. This sample is taken to the lab and the RNA, which is the virus genetic material, is extracted from the sample. This is very important. And the extracted RNA is converted to DNA. And the DNA that is you obtained, you want to quantify it. And to do that, you add primers, okay? And the primers will amplify the DNA to the point that a fluorescent dye, in this case, is called SYBR green, which changes color when a certain concentration is reached. What all this means is that the sample you obtain depending on how much virus you get, you are going to reach the time to detectable fluorescence based on the initial sample. So if you get a lot of virus from the patient's throat, it will take you less time to reach the fluorescent detection. If you get very little virus, then you have to amplify the DNA multiple times. In other words, you have to go through multiple cycles. The long and short of it is a cycling time, a low cycling time means that there's a lot of virus in the patient's body. A high cycling time means that there is very little virus. Next slide. Now, let me take this and compare COVID-19 to MERS. As um, Dr. Mensah told you, my center here in Saudi Arabia, we had the dubious distinction of having the most MERS patients in the whole wide world, okay, in terms of the largest study of MERS. In 2015, we had an outbreak of 130 patients and our hospital was closed. So we learned a lot from MERS. And now that we have COVID, we have the opportunity to compare the two. Now, all the COVID patients that we've seen now, which is averaging over 600 put together, discharged and currently in the hospital, the cycling time has been 32 or less, which means that the virus is heavily in the nasopharynx area. But interestingly, a lot of these patients with a CT value of even 16 or less did not deteriorate. In other words, you can find a patient walking around with a CT value of 16 and with the COVID-19 and nothing happens to them. But when they do deteriorate, some of them get better and few of them die. So far, we had only two patients with a CT value of 16 who have expired. Now, in comparison, in 2015, every single MERS patient we had with a CT value of 16 or below deteriorated and died. Next slide. Now, so what we can infer from this is COVID-19 is a highly transmissible virus with prominent asymptomatic viral shedding. Because of the heavy presence of virus in the nasopharyngeal area, where the olfactory bulb is in very close proximity, the symptom of loss of smell is common in this virus infection. And as Dr. Usu so eloquently put it, this is a portal of entry of the virus to the central nervous system, which can explain the encephalitis that some patients have. And I believe the portal of entry is either through the olfactory bulb or probably the cribriform place, which is in the same neighborhood. Okay, next slide. Uh -huh. So why is COVID-19 ravaging some areas of the world and sparing others? We do not know. But one thing we know for sure is Ghana, which has the very enviable distinction of being the most 
the country which is doing the most testing per capita on the African continent. We haven't had the virus ravaged through communities killing us. And yesterday, I was reading something about the president, um, Abufuado, and they were discussing ways by which they can relax some of the restrictions. And he made the statement that it seems like this virus is not killing Ghanaians as had been predicted. And it's very obvious. The reasons we do not know. It has been postulated that it may be due to the weather. They may have, we may have um, excess amounts of vitamin D, which is known to be an immune modulator. And we know that this virus does a lot of damage by the concept of cytokine store. And vitamin D is known to attenuate that store. Dr. Usu mentioned prior BCG vaccination. This is currently being investigated in Germany and Australia, where in Germany, actually, there is talk of using BCG as, quote, unquote, a bridge vaccine before the development of a vaccine for worldwide use. And then, obviously, you cannot discount the genetic predisposition. Various theories have been put forward, including one called the TCAM2 gene silencing. The TCAM2 gene was discovered in SARS-CoV-1, and it was observed that when you silence that gene, then you become susceptible to infection. And also having an extra X chromosome. We know that the X chromosome harbors genes which improve immunity in human beings. So women who have two X chromosomes are known to be less susceptible to infection than men. We know this from other infections. So that may play a role here. And even your blood group might determine whether you get SARS-CoV-2 or not. A study from China suggested that those with blood group A are more susceptible and those with blood group O are protected. And then we have the concept of the ACE2 receptor. You know, the ACE2 receptor, as Dr. Uzu mentioned, can be found on cardiac myocytes, um, pneumocytes, as well as enterocytes and other places which have been postulated. And we know the variety of ACE2 receptors. And there's one particular one called um, an ACE1D receptor, which the gene that codes for that also has a concomitant function of decreasing the production of ACE2. We know that the ACE1D gene is something which is very deficient in people of Asian descent. And probably that's the reason why they had a very bad outcome in the Far East. There are current studies going on studying the expression of ACE1D in other populations around the world, including Black Africans. And lastly, but definitely not the least, I could speak on this forever, there's definitely an association between HLA haplotypes and susceptibility to COVID infections. And you know the HLA um, genes regulate the major histocompatibility complex, which deal with antigen presentation and how we can fight off infection. So in a nutshell, we do not know why this virus is ravaging areas of the world and sparing others. But hopefully we'll know soon. Next slide. So basically, let me summarize my introduction. I haven't even started my presentation. We are dealing with a novel virus which is very much unlike SARS-CoV-1 and MERS. The virus is highly transmissible with probably um, a 30 to 40% asymptomatic carriage rates. And there are as yet undetermined factors influencing how humans react to the infection. And the gamut runs from being totally asymptomatic to becoming severely ill with multi-organ failure with a host of other you know, accompaniments like what we are discovering in children and people throwing clots in the lung and getting encephalitis and all that stuff. But pro probably what has touched every person on the surface of our planet now is COVID-19 has essentially shut the world economy down. And that one has affected everybody, including myself. I cannot go to Ghana. Anyway, next slide. Okay. So 
let me start off by giving the historical perspective of pandemics. Basically, pandemics can be described in three broad categories. A pandemic with a dead end. In other words, only humans get infected or can hold the pathogen. And the classic example is smallpox. And we have a pandemic with establishment of latency in humans. The classic is an HIV pandemic which means the HIV genetic material can be incorporated into the human genetic material. And then we have the pandemic with a spillover component, which is the most common form of pandemic. In other words, apart from humans, after doing mischief, the virus, bacteria, or whatever can go and hide somewhere else and raise head some other time. And this is the most common pandemic form of pandemic we know. But let me start off with the pandemic with a dead smallpox, okay? Let me start off with that next slide. Now, smallpox is a disease of antiquity. It has plagued us for over 3,000 years. Luckily, only humans could be infected. Actually, this is grammatically wrong. I should say could, not can be, because the disease is gone. Nobody has it anymore. There's no animal host. Mortality ranged between 30 to 40 percent. And as mentioned, we had smallpox episodically for 3,000 years. Next slide. Now, there are two types of viruses. The smallpox virus has two strains. There's variola major and variola minor. And the vaccine, um, which I'll describe later, is derived from um, vaccinia. Smallpox was eradicated from the world in 1977. Next slide. Next slide. And this is just quickly some dignitaries who had smallpox. You can see that is a disease which affected the, you know, the um, rich and the poor, royalty and everybody, just like COVID is doing now. It doesn't discriminate when it comes to class. Next slide. Next slide. Uh -huh. Um, the vaccine of smallpox started off as a concept called variolation, where passed from the, um, pass from the um, how do you call it, the lesion of the patient with smallpox was used to inoculate somebody who had not gotten the smallpox. In 1776, that's 100 years before the discovery of infancy school, Jenner used inoculation of pus from a cow who had cowpox in addition to those who had been inoculated with pus from a smallpox patient, and this led to complete pre prevention of the disease. By the way, when he did this, they thought he was crazy. They probably wanted to, you know, they, they dejected him, but that concept prevented people from getting smallpox. The current vaccine is derived from another pox virus called Vaccinia. Next slide. By the way, this concept of taking pus from a cow and giving it to a human being or pus from a patient with smallpox and giving it to somebody who's never had smallpox originated in multiple areas. And before this happened, by the way, this was introduced to Europe from Turkey. But before this happened, next slide, this concept reached the Americas through um, a very pro um, person that I've begun to you know, read a lot about. His name is Onesimus, who was a slave taken from the coastal region of West Africa, from the Coromance region, which I'm told encompasses you know, the Cape Coast area. I'm not, you know, I just started reading about this. But this guy left the coast of Ghana, was bought by a slave owner in Boston, and um, he was asked whether he has smallpox or not, and he said yes and no. And he taught his master the concept of inoculation of people who have not had smallpox with pus from patients who have had smallpox, and that protected them. And from this information, his slave owner was able to notify the authorities and inoculation with pass 
became very common in America in the late, mid to late 1700s as a result of the migration of an African slave to the Americas. And I think this is very significant. But the guy didn't, was not freed as a slave, by the way. Anyway, next slide. The last case of smallpox was in 1977 in a Somali national who um, <clears throat> went on to die of malaria in 2013. Um, next slide. So smallpox was eradicated in 1977. Why was that possible? It was possible because the virus infected only humans. There was no animal reservoir for it to go and hide for there to be recrudescent infection in the future. And luckily, since the 1700s, as we, I have told you, there, has been, there have always been effective vaccinations over the past 200 or so years. And probably most important is despite the fact that smallpox was still rampant, you know, in the Second World War era, First World War era, and the existence of the Cold War between Russia and the USSR, between the USSR and America, the international cooperation for smallpox um, eradication was very dramatic and it happened. And this is sadly not something we are seeing now with all the acrimony going on between the US and China and this and that. Next slide. This guy here I'm showing you on this slide, his name is Larry Brilliant. It's a guy who was very instrumental in the WHO's effort to eradicate smallpox. And he had some very interesting advice to give about COVID-19. And his advice is testing, 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 cooperation, cooperation, cooperation. No one country can do it by itself and you cannot have a handle of the disease without widespread testing. So testing, 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 cooperation, international cooperation, international cooperation, international cooperation. I hope that happens. So next slide. So we have seen a case of a pandemic with a dead end. Now let me talk about the influenza pandemics because this is what attracts a lot of attention. Now, influenza virus, as you very well may know, contains two surface glycoproteins, the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. There are 18 subtypes of hemagglutinin and nine, 11 subtypes of neuraminidase. Now, so H1, H2, H3, all the way to H18, and N1, N2, N3, all the way to N11. You can have them in various combinations, probably thousands of combinations. But of all the possible combinations, only 120 are of any significance. And even of the 120, just a handful are of pathogenic interest to us humans. H1N1, H2N2, H5N1, and a few others, I can recall them, okay? So, next slide. Now, the influenza virus lives in an ecosystem which I will briefly describe as follows. The virus place of domicile is in avian species, ducks, birds, pigeons, okay? they can be transmitted into swine pigs. Now, within the swine, they are mixed. The gene mixing occurs mainly in the swine. And out of the gene mixing, a virus can emerge, which can cause a lot of damage. Occasionally, a virus can emerge from an avian species and infect the world, as in 1918. The 1918 virus did not emerge from a pig. It emerged from avian species and caused all that havoc. Now, H1N1 has been known for 100 years and over. It is the virus that caused the 1918 epidemic, uh, pandemic, and it's the virus that caused the 2019 pandemic, 
and then we had an outbreak in Kumaka Kumasi some years back and sporadic outbreaks around the world. Interestingly, before COVID-19 came, what the WHO and other world bodies were worried about was not coronavirus. They were worried about H5N1. Because H5N1 is a very lethal form of influenza with very poor efficiency at infecting humans. But we know in the lab that this H5N1 could be artificially induced by way of a mutation such that it can become highly transmissible to humans. Now, this artificial mutation, which was done in Erasmus Medical Lab in Holland, can occur naturally. It's just a matter of time. So most pandemic preparedness have been based on H5N1. And then, I guess, COVID-19 overtook it and is now gathering all that attention. As we deal with COVID-19, we should not lose sight of the fact there are other potential viruses which can you know, cause pandemics. And as Dr. Wusu said, Ghana, anywhere, a virus could emerge from the woods and cause a pandemic. The key thing is having a system in place to deal with it when it happens. Next slide. Next slide. So this is the H5N1 bird flu, which um, infected 240 people in 1997 and killed 140. And we know that if this one gains a mutation such that it can be efficiently transmitted from human to human, then we are in trouble. Next slide. So recorded influenza pandemics, where I'll run through this, I've stated them already. The 1918 H1N1, the 1957 H2N2, the 1968 H3N2, and the 1976 H1N1, which killed reportedly one person, a US soldier in New Jersey. Now, why is this pandemic important? Because it involved one person and caused a lot of nervousness and fear, which led the US, next slide. Uh, I, I don't think the next slide, I, I may have to read from this next slide, okay. Um, in my revised copy, I think I, I missed this, George. So I have to read from this. In, in 1976, when there was a single US soldier who had the, um, H1N1 infection, it caused so much nervousness that the United States decided to vaccinate the whole country. And they got money from Congress. They rushed the drug companies to produce a vaccine within four months. And the president, Gerald Ford, went on TV and told everybody to get vaccinated. They went ahead and vaccinated 45 million people. Unfortunately, about 512 of them developed a serious complication called Guillain-Barré syndrome, of which about 80 died. The vaccine program was halted, and the Secretary of Health and Human Services at that time, along with the CDC director, both resigned. And because of hosts of other factors, Gerald Ford lost the presidency to Jimmy Carter. So it was, in the end, only one person died. The lesson to be learned from this is whenever you rush to produce a vaccine, you run the risk of making mistakes. The average time from research to vaccine administration to humans is anywhere from five to 10 years. We are now in a situation where we are expecting a vaccine by the end of this year. In other words, less than a year. When the vaccine comes out, we should expect that they may be side effects. They may not be side effects. We don't know. I'm just presenting you with a history that whenever you rush to produce a vaccine, um, you have to be ready for side effects. Now, the virus that caused the 1980 pandemic 
that kills 50 to 100 million people has been reconstructed in the lab by a team um, led by a guy by name, I believe his name is Tobin Berger and Anthony Fauci. They were able to find somebody who died of the influenza pandemic in Alaska and was buried in the snow, the permafrost. And from fragments of the virus in the patient's lungs, have been able to reconstruct the 1918 virus and learned that the M1 protein on top of the influenza virus and certain cytoplasmic proteins were responsible for the lethality of the 1918 virus, which they did not find in the 1976 virus. So from the reconstructed pandemic influenza virus in 1918, we, know, we now know a lot about the H1N1 virus, which continues to circulate in the world and causing occasional outbreaks in Ghana. We had one about two years ago at Kumaka. Next slide, please. So how have past influenza pandemics ended? One, you know, in influenza, you can have what they call antigenic drifts which can lead to a less lethal virus. We saw this in the H2N2 and H3N2 pandemics, but also the reverse can be true, that you can have antigenic drift to a more lethal virus. And this is what caused the second and third waves of the 1918 pandemic. Now, with this COVID-19, as we heard from Dr. Usu, it seems like we are seeing mutations, but it doesn't look like these mutations are leading to intensification of the lethality of the virus. I would like to believe that. But we should leave open the question that we should know that there can be worsening and there can be mutations which can lead to lessened lethality. And all this will impact when this pandemic will be over. You need to understand that RNA viruses in general do not have a proof reading mechanism. The coronaviruses are different because they have a three prime to five prime exoribonuclease, which does some proof reading, but it is not as efficient as DNA viruses. So mutations really can occur. And whether those mutations lead to lethal intensification of the lethality or diminution of the lethality, we do not know. Influenza pandemics have ended because effective chemotherapy has been developed in the name of oseltamivir, amantadine, and relenza. And most importantly, there has been vaccines which are be if not 100% efficacious, but they still exist. Next slide. The pandemic I want to talk next about is the, a pandemic with latency. And the classic example is HIV. And here we see an HIV particle which can um, enter a CD4 lymphocyte and integrate its genome into the human genome and thereby define itself as a latent virus. A lot has happened since HIV was first discovered. Next slide. HIV can be contained as a result of effective drug therapy. I remember when I was a medical student in the, <laughs> you know, um, 1990, the, around that time there was a single HIV drug, AZT. Subsequently, the concept of triple drug therapy led to the suppression of viral replication and the concept of viral suppression with undetectable virus. And for all intents and purposes, HIV has been contained. We do not have a vaccine, but at least the viral virus can be maximally suppressed. Next set, uh, slide. It is possible that COVID-19 eradication can happen with combination therapy. We know that remdesivir acts by inhibiting 
inhibiting the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It also serves as a nucleoside analog. Now, there are other targets, as Dr. Uzu mentioned, especially the spike protein, and the priming of the spike protein to bind to the ACE2 receptor, which is done by the TMP um, RSS2 protein. These are all sites by which pharmacological agents could work in concert with remdesivir, okay? And hopefully by using two or three drugs, um, eradication can be possible. We are lucky because COVID-19 cannot integrate into human genome like HIV. So if you have a combination cocktail, you might be able to completely eradicate the drug and have a radical cure, which will impact the um, disappearance of the um, pandemic you know, from the world. Next slide, please. Now, let me finish off by talking about a pandemic which has been historically defined as the pandemic which altered human behaviors, and that is the bubonic plague. And there are some interesting associations here that we can learn from. There are three major bubonic plagues in human history. The first one is the plague of Justinian, which happened towards the end of the fall of the Roman Empire in 542 AD, which is thought to have killed over 50 million people. The Roman Emperor Justinian himself contracted the bubonic plague and for some reason recovered. And the second plague was about 800 years later, and it was centered in Europe called the Black Death. And in, during this time, a lot of you know, things that we are accustomed to, to this day, developed. And the last plague was the Hong Kong plague, which started in 1894 and led to the discovery of the causative agent of the bubonic plague, which we know to be the gram-negative bacillus called Yersinia pestis, which was discovered by Alexander Yersin in um, actually Vietnam and named the bug in honor of his boss um, at the Pasteur Institute in France. There have been lesser outbreaks of the bubonic plague. And I want to mention the plague of Anwas in the Arabian Peninsula. Next slide. The plague of Anwas, also called the plague of Emaios, struck Syria in 638 AD. This was during the time of the prophet Muhammad. And this plague actually killed a few of the companions of the prophet Muhammad. Most notably, a guy by name of Abu Ubaidah bin al Jara. Now, this plague is important because it established the Islamic doctrine of quarantine, where the prophet Muhammad is reported to have said, if you hear of an outbreak of a plague in a land, do not enter it. And if the plague breaks out in a place while you are in it, do not leave the place. I was gratified to hear our president, Nana Kufuado, quote this on the eve of the beginning of Ramadan, exhorted Muslims in Ghana to obey restriction and quarantine and um, stay at home orders. But the president quoted these words, which have origin in the plague of Amwas. Next slide. Now, the origin of the word quarantine, and this is something very interesting also. In 1347, at the peak of the Black Death in Europe, um, in the Venetian city of Ragusa, which is modern day Croatia, Dubrovnik, they passed a law which um, <clears throat> mandated ships to stay at sea for 30 days before entering town if they are coming from a plague infected areas. Over time, this isolation period, which was called Trentino, was changed to 40 days, which in Italian was called Quarantino. And this is the origin of the modern English word 
quarantine. Next slide. Next slide. And this is a mass grave found in Toulouse, France in 1987. And the dental pulp DNA showed Yersinia pestis, the causative agent of plague. Attesting to the fact that all over Europe, for many, many years, the plague ravaged the place, killing up to 75 to 100 million people, it is said. Okay, this is how the plague exacted its toll in Europe over many, many years. Next slide. Now, I should mention that because death became so common, the concept of flagellation was practiced because they thought the human body or the man should rid him or herself of sin. And this practice of beating yourself until you bleed was sanctioned by the Pope and even Martin Luther, who was the leader of the Protestant church, regularly practiced self-flagellation as a means of mortification of the flesh. And whenever there is some unexplainable condition causing so much suffering, the concept of blame always comes. Jews, Arabs, and Christians were all blamed for the Black Death, depending on where they lived. Unfortunately, we are beginning to see that in this pandemic. You know, there have been television and radio reports on social media about Africans being persecuted in China, where reportedly the virus started, for no reason at all. And the other factions, um, the way things are playing out in some places of America, where they have politicized it. And, um, you know, I saw on the news one time, somebody got shot because um, he refused to put on a mask. All these things are happening as a result of frustration. And it is not new. We saw it in other pandemics. It is not new at all. Go ahead. Next slide. So I would like to conclude by posing the rhetorical question, which is the title of my um, talk. How should we expect the COVID-19 pandemic to end? We should understand that the pandemic will end or should end on two fronts, the social front and the medical front. Okay, the social front is the end of the fear and the medical front we'll talk about next slide. The medical front, we need a vaccine plus or minus effective therapy. Now, one thing we need to understand that even when a vaccine becomes available, not everybody will accept it. Now, um, oh, Henry, looks like you've muted yourself. OK. OK. Good. There's a certain segment of the population and it's estimated to be about 35% in the sample than in the US, that they stated that even if a vaccine becomes available, they will not take it, which raises the legal issue. Can people be required to get the vaccine when it becomes available? In most countries, when you are taking your child to school, you are required to have vaccination. Okay. In other words, if a vaccine becomes available, can people be required to take it? In other words, can you refuse to let somebody board an aeroplane if they cannot show you proof of vaccination against COVID-19? These are issues we have to contend with. In certain societies, it is not an issue. But in certain societies where uh, you know, they have legal rights and they can take a lawyer and all that stuff, you know, that becomes an issue. We need to think about that. The mutational arrest and slowing I've talked about, it is possible that this virus can acquire mutations along the way 
and become less lethal. Or it can become more lethal and cause second and third waves. As of now, neither is apparent. But this will define the medical end of this pandemic. Next slide. The social end of this pandemic is going to be defined by social distancing and lockdown fatigue, which seem to be happening now in certain societies. China was able to exert a very heavy hand in requiring people to stay in their homes for two months or so. In the United States, yesterday I saw, you know, I mean, people on the beach and, um, you know, people refusing to put on masks. So this is something that we need to understand that without prescribed social distances for the virus to be mitigated, we may have to live with the virus for a longer period of time. Okay? And maybe if there's the second or third wave and they go back to be with it, they might do it the right way. A typical example can be given with Singapore. Singapore opened up the society about a month and a half ago and immediately they had a very heavy second spike and then they went back and attacked it with a very heavy hand. So this concept of lockdown fatigue and social distancing fatigue, which appears to be happening now, um, will probably impact when this COVID-19 is over. Now, let me talk about stigmatization and persecution. I have given you evidence of stigmatization and persecution in the Middle Ages in the bubonic plague. Unfortunately, now we are having this persecution. And like I told you, I really saddened my heart to read the news reports of Africans being accused of, you know, being refused hotel rooms in China and, um, you know, being discriminated against for no other reason, I believe, than, you know, being different. So the concept of stigmatization needs to be dealt with. I'm also encouraged by the efforts of various entities in Ghana, especially MTA, and I see it on my phone all the time, sending messages, exhorting people to interact with people who have recovered from COVID-19 and trying to beat down this stigmatization um, principle and persecution. So when this COVID-19 will end, I cannot give you a specific date. But I have enumerated factors which will impact how this virus will evolve. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Dr. Henry Bapubodi. Thank you so very much. The audience really appreciates um, the insights you have also presented. And so now I think we are all the more informed and more knowledgeable about what is happening in the current pandemic. Um, we will open the floor for questions and answers. We have had um, several requests for the slides, and, but that will have to be a decision made by the, each uh, presenter. If, um, if presenters want their slides to be shared, they will be shared, but otherwise we'll respect the, uh, the confidentiality or the choice that the that the speaker makes. Okay, so the floor is open for questions. George, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. All right. Um, I don't see anybody raising a hand or asking a question on the chat box. One question here. Oh, okay. If Emmanuel, Dr. Adabo has a question. Um, Emmanuel, you want to say what your question is?
I saw a hand raised. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, any conclusion? Let me, John, you can you can read out the questions if you have them. Oh, the questions we had at the beginning. Okay. Um, I thought you had addressed some of those. Let me let me get those questions. All right. So one of them, we actually have so many questions. There are 14 questions in all. Mm. Um, let me put... Let me stop sharing this. We cut across various... Um, Give me a few minutes to to get that those questions together. Tony was sending me a message. Tony is also born here. Do we see them? Yes. Okay. So, um, Dr. Ousu and Dr. Bafuboni, you may choose any of these questions that you you, would, you feel um, inclined to answer and, and, and address them. Okay. Uh, uh, hello, uh, George. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, I think uh, part of my presentation addressed some of the questions. The first is on mutations, which uh, were addressed. The second on the differences in the phenotypes among diverse ethnicities. I think that the information we have uh, is still not enough for us to look at the level of ethnic groups and see whether there are differences in immunophenotypes or not. It's still an emerging field that is still being researched. The third is what is causing mortality rate of SARS-2 to be low in Africa. I think we are all trying to make projections based on the information we have, but there need to be a study that will compare the African population and the Western world from immunology of how they respond looking at past history of infections or the coronavirus, human strains, antibody cross protection, and many things that we need to know. And even the strains that we have, whether they are similar to the earlier Wuhan strain or something has happened. This we still don't know. And it's difficult for us to tell the reason why this is. It's a research area that many people can take up to enable us to know this more. The variants, I think I mentioned the variants uh, when I was uh, giving my presentations to know where we are. But then the genomes which have been sequenced are few. It's only few full genomes we have. Some of the genomes are just based on the RDR, GP gene and spike genes. But then as we get information on the full genomes, it will be, more, it will be better that we, we, we can tell how this is going. Okay, On thank you very much. Okay, you see, there I'll are some... to uh, the other doc, uh, but my colleague Henry, to talk about the recoveries, but he is a clinician, so I'm sure he will best understand. All right, so there are the some, other, lasting... some new questions that have been presented. So okay, I'd like okay. to. Um, so, question to Dr. Michael Do you have a, a repository where you deposit um, sequence data? From Ghana, and this can go so, to either mm -hmm. Dr. Bafuboni or Dr. Usu. Is it possible that the virus will become less lethal as an evolutionary mechanism to survive? And then another question: based on the current trend, how long 
so we get, we have herd immune, immunity, herd immunity. I'll let Dr. Usu um, go first on the um, repository question first. Can you take on that? Uh, yeah, so the, the first, I think, 15 genomes from the West African Center for Infection and Pathogens has been deposited at the Nextron website. I showed a picture of this brief uh, in a, my presentation. I can share the link with you. You can go to the website and download the sequence. And many other sequences from Africa, uh, from Congo, from South Africa, and many other hmm. places are being deposited in that place. So you can easily download and use this for uh, many, any other activity that, that you want. Uh, the second question of whether the virus can become uh, less lethal. Uh, I, I want to believe so because, uh, like I said, the wild strain, I want to agree with the hypothesis that the wild strain seems to be losing one or two uh, uh, points as, as it evolves and moves from one population to the other. So like we, we know for the SARS-1, as at now, I mean, the screenings we do in Ghana for the flu, we still identify SARS-1 in people. We still have them, but those people are fine. They have mild disease, they just cough, but they have SARS-1 or two in them. So just as SARS-1 has become normal and people are not getting sick and dying from SARS-1, I want to believe that as this runs, we get to a point where the strains we have, we are able to accommodate them and they can become used to us and they will be fine with it. But this depends on how, 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 how long the immunity will last. Uh, SARS-1 is believed to last for two to three years based on research that has been done. I don't know how long SARS-2 will last. We are only hoping that SARS-2 will give us some, lot of, some form of immunity after two years so we don't enter into an, another epidemic wave. And also this depends on new bonds that will come. If we have new bonds who will come in within this, new, uh, within this two or three years and then the immunity, immunity wanes, then we can have surges of infection in new bonds and that can be a problem that we have to grapple with. And the last Thank you very much. Immunity, uh, you, I don't, um, can I, I don't know, maybe yeah, I leave ahead. it for Dr. Bonnie on the, on the herd immunity. So on herd immunity, uh, you can test, you can tell herd immunity when you cover at least 60 to 70% of the population. So th this assumes that if you have 60 to 70% of people hit by the virus and you hit your peak, you will not enter into a decline phase where the number of new cases begin to reduce and your productive number begins to fall below one. Then you'll be more confident that you are, in, you, are, you are getting closer and closer to herd immunity. But this depends on how many tests you can do. And as, as we speak, uh, many countries cannot achieve the coverage of testing. In Ghana, we are not able to test that much, although the number is high. We still don't have serological kit that can tell how many have recovered and how many have active IgM or IgG antibodies in circulation. So until you do this, you are still in the dark and you can't tell how much you have covered and, and therefore cannot tell whether you are getting herd immunity or not. Mm -hmm. This is just unfeeling. I think the doctor, do, Dr. Henry Buffo will come. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you on the, the issue of the herd immunity becomes almost a mute point when you are dealing with a class of viruses where we know MERS and SARS, the immunity wanes after maximum 36 months, okay? Now, historically, we know that using the influenza viruses as an example, during the course of a pandemic, historically, there has been decreased lethality based on mutations. So I agree with Dr. Usu that, you know, it is very likely that we will expect less lethal virus. But at the same time, we need to understand that it can mutate in the other direction. Okay, but we can have a mutation which will cause intensification of vaccines, and that's also possible. But historically, using history as a guide, usually we go towards the less lethal side. But the herd immunity, I don't believe Ghana has the um, capability at present to establish a case for pursuing herd immunity when we cannot do antibiotic testing, um, antibody testing on a widespread scale like you mentioned. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Doc, Dr. Bafumoni. There are, a two, there are a few new questions coming in. Um, I'll just read out. This is from Zakaria Seidu. Uh, considering that the COVID-19 coronavirus does not integrate into the hum genome of humans, we yes. will likely see a medical a medical end to COVID-19 with an effective vaccine and drug therapy. Uh, that, that's a question mark. So it's a statement with a question mark at the end. Um, there, are, there are a couple of others. Let me just read this quickly so that you... Um, what is the time frame in days for a patient's recovery, especially for those in isolation? Um, the other question, given the presentation, do you think we should allow our students to go back to school? Mm -hmm. Given the nature of our classrooms and the class size, since I do not see how these students can observe the social distancing protocols. Okay, so okay. That, that let, let me take on the um, clinical part, the issue of recovery. Now, in my practice of infectious diseases, I haven't seen any virus as strange as this one. You know, you can have somebody who has the virus and will not show any symptoms. Currently, we have about 300 and something people in quarantine. And some of them, they are making noise. They don't have any symptoms at all, but they are in quarantine. At the same time, somebody will get the virus and go to the ICU and be on a ventilator, kidney failure, to the point of death. So who goes in which direction, we do not know. I cannot give you that if you get corona, in three days you recover, in one week you recover. And I don't believe anybody can do that. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Bafumoni. Dr. Wusu, any thoughts? Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Bafumoni. Dr. Wusu, any thoughts? Yes, uh, please, if you can, the, the second and third question, I think you mentioned, if you can please mention this again. Okay, so this, um, the second question was, uh, what is the time frame in, in days for a patient's discovery, especially for those in isolation? I think Dr. Balkumbody has addressed that. The, the, uh, the, other question, the other question was, given the presentation, do you think we can allow our patients to go back to school? Given the nature of our classrooms and the class size, how, how do we observe the as, isolation protocols? There was a question earlier, um, Dr. Usu, from Zakaria Seidu, saying that considering that the COVID-19 coronavirus does not integrate into the genome of humans, we will likely see a medical end, um, whether it's vaccine or therapy. Um, Dr. Bodhi, what could drive the genetic drift of the pathogen from being less lethal to increase lethality? Do you have some examples of such events? Uh, okay, so uh, on the time frame, I think uh, Dr. Bafu, uh, Henry Bonny has indicated, but uh, what we've observed uh, in cases here from the few data is that uh, when, when uh, patients come in, um, their samples come to our end, and then we test these samples uh, after clinical recovery. I mean, when they don't have any symptoms, and then they are fine. Most of the time, it's within about six to 10 days, about 30% of them will become negative. And then after about 14 days, uh, cumulatively 60% may become I mean, negative, meaning they will recover. Then it inches up to about uh, 90% to 100%. So basically it takes about three weeks, sometimes even up to a month for people to clear the virus totally from their system. So the level of persistence of the virus, like uh, Dr. Henry Buffo said, you can tell it differs from patient to patient. Some can recover quickly, Others, it can persist in them. But like we said, it's not as if they are sick. They are normal. They can laugh with you. They don't have any problem. But they can live with it for some time. And this is why in Ghana, people would not want to go to isolation because for them, they are, they are healthy. They are not exactly. sick. Yet the, the public health feels that they should go to isolation. They, they, are, they keep fighting with the public health officials. It's becoming very difficult for, for them to uh, adhere to this. The second question on schools, whether schools should be open. So I wouldn't want to advise from what I have seen, uh, from the few data I have observed that 
a school should be open because we don't have the mechanisms, the structure in place to adhere to or to practice this social distancing. Our classrooms, by their nature, are, are crowded. The churches are already, the way they are built up, people, you can't do social distancing. And especially in young children, five, five and ten years and below, you cannot, you cannot enforce wearing of masks. You cannot practice this. And, it's, it's difficult. and also because Ghana, we've had two unusual deaths, one in a nine-year-old child without any COVID disease, the second is a 20-year-old child without any comorbid disease. These are significant for me. It tells me that if you are to expand the larger population below 10 years, it's possible to have people without any comorbid disease die from this. So it is better for us to wait and then uh, allow the reproductive number to fall below one for certain populations before we can think of easing restrictions. This even have to be in phases based on what we have. And I'm a bit careful that we should not rush to go to school and put the children at risk. And also because testing capacity is not really available. We are doing few testing. So if the schools, if there are surges in the school, getting immediate testing and results for them to enable isolation and contact tracing is almost impossible. And until we augment this, I think that we should be very careful with uh, going by, by, by this. And these are my few thoughts, thoughts on this. Thank you very yeah, much, Dr. Um, George, I, I just want to add an anecdote to this because it, it might interest you to know that here in Saudi Arabia, at my hospital, using in 2015, when we had that large MERS outbreak, the recovery rate of patients who tested positive was far quicker than we are seeing now. If somebody tested for MERS and we we, we started, you know, we tested him again about a week later and they, they are doing better. The clearance of the virus was a lot faster than we are seeing now. Now, people are testing positive up until one month after initial discovery, as Dr. Wusi is saying, for whatever reason. So it, it seems to me like the body takes a longer time to clear this virus than other coronaviruses. That's my initial impression based on my experience in dealing with two, the MERS and the um, um, COVID-19. Thank you very much, Dr. Mbafubodi, Dr. Michael Ousu. Um, uh, Adamu Sanid, I don't know if you still have your question. Your hand was up. Um, but otherwise, we've gotten other messages, people expressing thanks. Um, um, Dr. Kafui uh, Amponsa says that what you are saying is very serious uh, and she thanks you for your insights. Um, let me see if there's another. Okay, so there, there are no new questions coming in. So um, it has been a, a, a very exciting um, session, even though we are dealing with a grave matter, but we've all been enlightened. We've had insights from Dr. Wusu and Dr. Bafuboni. We appreciate your... Oh, okay, Adamu, Adamu Sanid has his question. His question is, what is the current state of using serum from recovered COVID-19 patients to treat current COVID-19 patients? The use of serum from recovered patients. Well, um, in Saudi Arabia, at least at my center, we just started doing that. Now, we only use that for patients who are in the ICU. You know, in other words, if you have um, COVID-19 and you have a pneumonia and you are not intubated, you are not in the ICU and not critical, we don't give you that. But for critical cases who you know, are on the ventilator and they develop some other organ damage, the convalescent serum treatment protocol is going to be initiated. And we've done it for less than two weeks and I cannot give you any, um, you know, feedback as to how they do. I mean, one thing I can tell you is you don't give it and then they wake up and start walking out of the hospital. No, it's adjunctive therapy and we are yet to know on a large scale whether it helps. And this will be only possible after, you know, 
we are deep in the, long into the pandemic and we have enough cases to um, tell us whether it's useful or not. But yes, it's being done, yes. I don't know about Ghana. I don't know about Ghana. All right. Yes, so, uh, just to contribute from the Ghana side, I'm aware that the, the National Blood Transfusion Services are currently developing a protocol that will allow for transfusion uh, using uh, serum from patients. And you know the way it goes in Ghana, it has to go through the Food and Drugs Authority for them to seek uh, consent uh, because it's a, a therapy that you have to uh, administer. So all the same protocols will have to, we have to be adhered to. And once they are done, I'm sure they will start asking for donors from this group to enable them to attend to uh, these patients. Thank you all very much. Um, just by way of announcement, um, we will continue with our next in the series on on Thursday, and this time we've learned some lessons here. So hopefully we'll, we'll not have these uh, these difficulties we had at the beginning. So um, we, we, we'll look forward to more from um, our participants from Noguchi, as well as from Brigham and Women um, at Harvard in, in the Boston, Massachusetts. Um, so we thank you all for your uh, participation, your questions. We thank the panelists for their presentations. And again, we'll leave it up to the panelists. If they decide that they want to share their, their slides, we will email those to the participants. Yeah, you know, George, you have my permission to give to anybody who has my slides, fine. That's fine with me. Okay, so well, we'll make Dr. Bafubody's uh, presentation available. I, I need to modify my bit, and then I will send you the slide again for you to share. I, I'll do some few modifications. Okay, so Dr. Um, Ousu will also be happy to share his slides um, following some modification. So we'll, we'll, we'll follow through with that. You should get some information. Uh, we thank you all for your participation. We thank the organizers, Dr. 